What is up guys? Welcome back to another GeekoWatt video. And in this video, I'm going to be showing you how to build a budget gaming PC build for 2021 and 2022. I'll be running you through all the components that make this system possible. A build that comes in around about the $500 mark that you can actually build right now. Stay tuned to see just how we've done it. In this video, I'll be walking you through all the component choices, showing you how to put the system together step by step from start to finish before testing it out to see how well the system performs. Let's dive into it though after a quick ad from today's video sponsor. The NZXT capsule microphone is the latest addition to a killer NZXT lineup. With a plug and play design, cardioid pickup pattern which captures your voice and nothing else and pre-configured gain, this mic is ready to rock and roll from day one. The 24-bit 96kHz resolution stands out and ensures excellent sound quality. And when paired with the new NZXT boom arm, you really can upgrade your streaming game with the power of the NZXT capsule. Check out the first links in the description below to learn more. Let's kick things off by taking a look at the motherboard, RAM, SSD and CPU to begin with. All of these components can be installed before you even start worrying about your PC's case, making things that little bit easier, especially for a beginner. The motherboard I've gone for in this build is Gigabyte's B450M S2H. This is one of the best value motherboards on the market for those looking to pair up a Ryzen CPU. This is a fantastic value motherboard for those looking to get into the world of PC gaming on a bit of a budget. It supports Ryzen 3000 desktop processors out of the box, has a little bit of overclocking headroom and allows us to set our memory speed through XMP. That's very important when it comes to an AMD build. I'm going to be coupling this motherboard up with AMD's Ryzen 3 3100. This CPU was previously a bit of a phantom in that it was always disappearing and never available to buy. But AMD appeared to have sorted out that issue and this chip can now be found for an astonishing price point. With four cores and some decent clock speeds, it really does tick off every base needed on a budget build like this one. And I'd even go as far to say that it would be a good match for something like a GTX 1660 Super if you upgraded the graphics card later on. In order to install this, you want to locate the golden triangle on the processor, and we want to line this up with the top left-hand corner of our CPU socket. Drop the chip in nice and gently, and then secure the arm on our Ryzen socket back down. As far as Ryzen CPUs go, that's basically all there is to it. One major advantage of AMD Ryzen is the cooler you get included. This AMD stock cooler comes with pretty much every Ryzen processor and does an awesome job of keeping it cool without costing you any extra money. You haven't got to spend $40, $50 on a budget air cooler or even $100 on an all-in-one liquid cooler when you get this included in the box with their budget processors. This one is super easy to install. Just locate the four screws on the corner of your cooler and match these up with the four backplate screws through your motherboard. This will come with pre-applied thermal paste, but ours has been used before, so we need to drop a dab of our own on before actually screwing that cooler in. Really is nice and easy. Screw it down corner by corner. Nice and gently, no major pressure or force is required and the CPU and the CPU cooler are then basically complete. Next up on the agenda is our RAM or our memory. Now this here is a 16 gigabyte kit of Corsair's Vengeance RGB RT. It's been optimized for use with a Ryzen processor, which is good for our build today. And it has a little bit of white accenting on as well, which I always find to be a little bit cool. It is an RGB RAM kit and you may pay, you know, a little bit more for the pleasure, but this is one of Corsair's budget options on the market and will be cheaper than many of the non-RGB alternatives that are also available. In order to install this in your motherboard, you want to find the notch on the memory. This isn't in the middle, it's actually slightly off center, so do be careful. And then go ahead and actually pull back the clips on your RAM dims themselves. You can see here we've got a clip on both sides and for us, we need both of the dim slots. You're then gonna slide the RAM into place, that's the wrong way around, and actually click this in. You should hear a satisfying Click sound before doing this, just repeat for as many dims as you've got. This is the time though I come clean, I have made an error. I've popped the CPU cooler on the wrong way around and the AMD logo is now in the way of the RAM dim slot. So let me just go ahead, flip this to the other side and then I can pop our second dim in to give us 16 gigabytes of memory. A nice future-proofed amount that would also work well for system or GPU upgrades later down the line. With that issue remedied, we can move on then to the storage. This is the last component to install into the motherboard before we move it into the case. Samsung's SSD 980 is a budget take on their famous 980 and 980 Pro drives. 
This unit here has read speeds in the region of three and a half gigabytes a second. Writes might be a little bit lower, but as far as an all rounder goes, this is pretty spot on. We're going to be installing it into our motherboard today, which doesn't actually support Gen 4 drives anyway, or at least can't give them the speed that they require. So this Gen 3 drive is an awesome choice. We'll be installing it into this gold slot here. And for this, as a word of warning, you won't need any normal screwdriver. You will need a TD tiny little screwdriver that's capable of removing the smallest of screws. You can see our 980 drive here with its little gold notch on its contact strip. We're going to be matching this up with the corresponding notch on the slot itself around sort of three quarters of the way up on this motherboard. Remove the retention screw marked 80 before you go ahead and actually fasten the drive into place. Slide in our SSD in with no problems whatsoever. Once you've done that, you can then secure back down the screw we've just taken out, and that's pretty much it as far as the motherboard assembly goes. At this stage, the motherboard is ready to go ahead and be moved into the case choice. This is a really nice budget case from Bitphoenix with some awesome mesh at the front, some RGB fans included as standard, and this really nice tempered glass side panel. This is gonna be a great choice today because it doesn't break the bank, it supports all of our hardware, and crucially, keeps things nice and cool. Admittedly, when you're using the AMD stock cooler, you do wanna give it a little bit more airflow, as temperatures might run just a bit higher than something like a Cooler Master Hyper 212 Evo. But we don't wanna spend that money, we wanna channel that into our hardware instead. In order to install this into the case, first remove all of the side panels, front and rear, this is a good general rule of thumb to make the case a little bit easier to deal with. Once this is done, the next step is to pop the motherboard into the case. Go ahead and install the IO shield first. This is the metal plate that comes included with your motherboard and clips into the rear rectangular portion of the case. Once you've done this, you can locate the holes on the motherboard. So we've got two at the top, two across the middle and two across the bottom. And these are what we call our standoff holes. You want to match these up with the standoffs in the case. These are gold, nice and stand out in our instance. And if these ones don't match up, grab yourself a pair of pliers and a screwdriver and just move them so they align with the motherboard itself. Then you can go ahead, slide the motherboard in, pop some screws in to secure it into place. And that's pretty much all there is to it. You should now have a lovely IO poking through the metal IO shield and the motherboard that's installed inside of our Bitphoenix chassis. That then moves us on to the final couple of components. And I'm gonna wait and do the GPU last. I'm gonna make you guys wait because first we just need to pop in the power supply. In short, this is a 500 watt unit from Cooler Master that ticks all of the boxes on a budget. Not very good if you're looking to rock an RTX 3070, but for a build like this one that's super cheap, super low power, this is gonna be more than good enough. Go ahead and screw it into the back of the case with the fan facing down, pulling fresh air in from under the chassis, and we'll deal with the cables and wiring a bit later. The power supply is definitely going to be more than sufficient enough to power this, the graphics card for today's system. Now wait, don't click off, don't go anywhere, I know what you're thinking, James. A GT 1030? Really? Check out a recent video we made where we compared the three viable budget GPU options for 2021. One of the best things about this card is that it's not very good for mining at all. In fact, I don't even think this thing can mine cryptocurrency at any decent rate, meaning miners and scalpers haven't bothered to go ahead and pick them up. It also uses much less silicon in terms of raw material than something like an RTX 3060, meaning supplies are much more readily available. You can find this card for under $100 quite regularly, even on the new and the used markets, making it perfect for what is essentially a $500 or there or thereabouts gaming PC. Latest pricing and availability info can be found at the affiliate links down in the description below. One thing to look out for with the 1030 is that you make sure you go for the GDDR5, not the DDDR4 variant. This gives you much faster memory and will give you a lot better performance. This card works really well though. It's a one slot single form factor and has some active cooling to help keep temperatures low. You're probably going to be very surprised by the performance you can achieve on this card. But as a bit of a sneak peek, check out some of the gameplay recorded directly on the 1030 on your screen now. This shows that the 1030 is no slouch and will really, really do a good job of providing you some fantastic performance if you're playing the right titles on a budget. To install this, we've got plenty of room. We just need to use our top PCI slot here, push back the retention clip and slide the card into place. You might need to just adjust your rear PCIe cover before sliding in the card into place. Line up with the slot, apply a bit of pressure and the GPU will nice and snugly fit. Fasten it down with a screw that you get included with your case, and that will stop it from sagging and uh, going anywhere. And that's pretty much this system done as far as core components go. There are a few cables and wiring though that we need to plug up before we actually power the PC up and test it out. 
That includes our CPU power connector, which is eight pins and goes to the top left-hand corner of the motherboard. All these cables are gonna originate and come from your power supply. You also need to plug up a 24-pin motherboard power cable. This goes to the right-hand side of the board and it's the largest connector you'll deal with today, full stop. Finally then, we just need to pop on the front panel connectors. This includes USB 3. Uh, which is blue and pretty large and is notched, meaning it will only go in one way round. Our HD audio connector, which goes to the bottom left of the motherboard for the headphone and mic jacks. And then our JFP1 front panel cables. These are the famous fiddly pins uh, that you worry you're gonna install wrong and that the whole thing's gonna explode, but it won't. Uh, check out the diagram on your screen now and take your time. If you get these the wrong way around, all that will happen is that your power or your reset button just won't work. So go back, uh, amend these, get them in the right locations, and that's pretty much it as far as making sure your system is powered up and ready to go. Before we actually test this out in some of the latest games though, and some really, really popular esports titles, let's see just how good it looks with all those RGB fans, all that really nice hardware in an epic glam montage. I'll see you in a sec, but first, roll that legendary GeekoWatt montage. <laughs> When it comes to the performance of this now that we've seen just how good our super budget 1030 oriented system looks, the big question I'm about to answer is the one I'm sure you've all been waiting for. How well does it actually perform? I sing the 1030s praises on a regular basis, and there's good reason for that. It performs very well for a sub $100 price point and actually surprises a number of people in a lot of titles. I'm going to kick things off by looking at Apex Legends, one of the most, if not the most popular game on the market right now. At 1080p low settings, we got just shy of 60 FPS on average. So far, so good for the 1030. Even at low, the latest AAA titles still visually look pretty good and most people, even on high-end GPUs, like to play with what they call competitive, aka low settings, with the render distance set to far. 90 and 99th percentile results were good as well, meaning the game never really uh, dropped below the 52 FPS mark on the whole, giving you a consistent playing experience on what is, after all, a super cheap system. Next up is Valorant, and this is a game that really impresses me on any card. Here at 1080p medium settings, we got 265 frames per second. 265 on a 1030. 222 frames and 185 rounded us off with strong 90 and 99th percentile results, meaning the game never really dropped below the 185 mark. Impressive. Fortnite is the next game today, probably the second most popular title right now behind Apex. Let me know if there's any other games you guys are playing in the comments below. Here we got over 60, we got over 70, we got 72 frames per second on average, with over 60 FPS for the 90th uh, percentile result, and just shy of 60 FPS for the 99th. Consistent frame rates all around in Fortnite at 1080p, low slash competitive settings. What about Rainbow Six Siege though? Well, here at 1080p, uh, competitive 1080p low settings, we got 58 frames a second. Once again, another title that can deliver 60 FPS on a GT 1030. What if you want more than 60 FPS though and you're an Overwatch player out there? Can you achieve it? The short answer, yes. At 1080p, with some of the settings tuned down, we got 87 FPS on average in Overwatch, really showing that the 1030 is all about what games you want to play. If you're looking to play Cyberpunk, you're looking to play the latest AAA titles, you're probably not going to have much luck. In fact, you shouldn't buy this card. But if you're an esports-oriented player who likes Fortnite, Rainbow Six, Overwatch and CSGO, this is definitely something you should consider. Talking of CSGO, it rounds up our test today, and here we got 123 frames per second on average. This was at 1080p medium settings as well, so you could definitely tune down to low and get even more frame rate if that's what you're concerned about. All in all, we were really impressed with this system. The 1030 is something I've recommended for a while to the right kind of gamers out there. As I say, AAA titles, forget it. Pick yourself up a use 1650, but don't discount the 1030 just yet. And that pretty much wraps it up for not only the benchmarks today, but the whole video. If you enjoyed this one, give it a big old like rating. Make sure to get subscribed. Thanks for tuning in though. And as always, we'll see you in the next one.